Hello everyone and welcome back to Push Square Deep Dive. This is the show where we take a closer look at the world, characters and stories of your favourite PlayStation exclusives. And today we're going on a journey across the Nine Realms. With the release of God of War Ragnarok just a few weeks away at the time of recording, I thought it was time that we answered the big question. What actually is Ragnarok? So over the last month or so, I have been obsessively reading up on all things Norse mythology because I wanted to piece together the exact nature of it all. What was the actual event? Why did it take place? What were the events that led up to it? Who were the major characters involved? And most importantly, what happens when you throw in the Greek god of war? Now, that means that this video is going to be primarily from the perspective of Norse mythology, not the mythology within the God of War game. However, a lot of it is transferable as this is a retelling of that tale, so you may consider what I'm about to discuss as spoilers. But for those of you that would love to know the difference between the Jotnar and the Aesir, your Yggdrasils from your Emirs, then stick around for our next Push Square Deep Dive. Ragnarok, quite simply put, is the end of everything in the cosmos, even that of the gods. In fact, the word Ragnarok roughly translates in Old Norse to the fate of the gods, or in other pronunciations, the twilight of the gods. It was a cataclysmic clash between the Aesir gods such as Odin, Thor and Heimdall and the giant Jotnar, namely Loki, Fenrir and Jormungandr. However, with every hammer swung and jaw snapped, there were millennia of history permeating its way through this inevitable conflict. And what better start does history have than the beginning? In today's summation of the creation of the realms, we cannot go through every Aesir, Vanir and Jotun that ever was to be because the family tree of Amir is vast and convoluted. But know that that name, Amir, holds some serious weight because this is the first being the giant of which all life in the Nine Realms stems from. In the beginning, there was just the Fire Realm of Muspelheim and the Ice Realm of Niflheim, both created from the cosmic realm of Ganungagap. The fire of Muspelheim melted the ice of Niflheim and from it, Amir was born. But the giant was not alone as he was also joined in creation by a cosmic cow. Yes, a cosmic cow, by the name of Aldhimbla. Amir was responsible for the creation of other giants, but Aldhimbla, which relied purely on the salt of rock for survival, licked the first of the Aesir into existence. Skipping some generations from the offspring of Aldhimbla, Odin and his brothers Vili and Ve were born. These three had plans, visions of a new world, and that new world began with the death of Amir. Slaying the sleeping giant, the bloods of Amir drowned its kin, the frost giants, and so began an age-old feud between the Aesir and the Jotnar. A feud that would one day spill the end of all living things. However, Odin was not done with Amir. Using his skull for the skies, his blood for the seas, teeth for the mountains and hair for the forests, Amir's corpse sprouted all that we know in our world today, along with the nine realms of the world tree Yggdrasil, and those who lived among them. This sacred ash tree has many interpretations, but it is clear that its roots reached out to each of the nine realms, those being Asgard of the gods, Midgard of men, Niflheim of ice and Muspelheim of fire, Alfheim of the elves, Vanaheim of the Vanir, Helheim of the dead, Jotunheim of the giants, and Svartalheim of the dwarfs. With its creation, a golden age between the Aesir of Asgard and the men of Midgard began, with the men worshipping the gods, and in return, the gods protecting Midgard from the invading giants. During this age, Odin and his sons Baldur and Thor and their children made strong enemies out of the offspring of Amir. However, there would be no enemy stronger than Loki and his kin, Fenrir the giant wolf, and Jormungandr the world serpent. Across the years, the Jotnar and the Aesir pranked, tricked and deceived each other, However, the majority of their feud stemmed from the gods' fear of prophecy, for they knew of the carnage that was to come and would often go to great lengths to stop the few who would bring it upon them. Yet their preventative efforts against the likes of Loki and his kin 
only fueled the fires of prophecy, as there was nothing stopping what was coming, and the beginning of the end was marked by a cold and baiting wind. Thimble winter was long foretold to precede Ragnarok, a three-year winter with no summer in between, and each one colder than the last. This would spell the dark final times for the men of Midgard, the harsh winds made it increasingly difficult to hunt. As supplies dwindled, clans went hungry and families were forced to turn to their pets for food. Eventually, war broke out as clans turned on each other for provisions, but the worst was yet to come. Resources became so scarce and survival so difficult that all morals and laws were abandoned as friends, neighbours and even family drenched their axes and swords in each other's blood. However, there was one final event to wipe out the Age of Man for good. From the beginning of time, Skoll and Hattie, the Manigarm's wolf offspring of Fenrir, grandchildren of Loki, had been on an eternal quest to chase and consume both the sun and the moon. For an age, Skoll and Hattie's pursuit had perpetuated the day and night cycle. However, with their insurmountable stamina and incredible speed, eventually the two would catch their prey and plunged the world into darkness, and so the Age of Man ended in the dark, cold grasps of Thimble Winter. Their supposed Asgardian protectors watched on, knowing that the beginning of Ragnarok had been marked, knowing that all that was left was the inevitable clash between them and their oldest enemies. A battle of epic proportions broke out between the two sides. Odin, Thor, Heimdall, Magni and Modi, the Valkyrie and even the fallen soldiers of Valhalla took the fight to the Jotnar. However, Loki's army was also great, consisting of Fenrir, Jormungandr, Frost Giants, the dead of Helheim and most importantly, Sutra, the fire giant of Muspelheim. Their clash was unlike anything ever seen, wreaking sheer chaos across the realms. Each of the gods had their own respective jewels that they sought out during the battle. Fenrir swallowed Odin the Allfather whole, yet he was slain by Odin's son, Vidar. Thor eventually conquered the world serpent Jormungandr with a mighty blow from his hammer Mjolnir. Yet in the process, he burst one of the serpent's poisonous sacks killing himself along with it. Loki and Heimdall struck each other, both succumbing to their wounds, and eventually the armies of both sides were depleted, and with the mad Sutra setting everything ablaze with his fire sword, the worlds were consumed by flames and sunk into the seas. However, over time, the sea levels lowered, and from the ashes of the old world, a new life began. Preserved within the world tree, a man and woman were sent off to repopulate the world and thus began a new age, an age without the gods. This has been a highly abbreviated version of the events of Ragnarok, but there is one important element we have yet to consider. What happens when you involve an outsider to the mythology like Kratos? Well already from the 2018 game we have seen a number of differences in the telling of these prophecies and the perspectives of which they are told. For one, rather than the tragic heroes of the tale, Odin and his family are the villains here. All over Midgard, Odin is seen as this oppressive shadow and Thor as a ruthless murderer. Baldur, who is the most beloved of the gods in the mythology, is the primary antagonist of the game. And of course, our biggest change lies with Atreus and Kratos. Within the mythology, Loki is born to both Laufey and Forbotti. However, here it is Laufey and Kratos. Loki is at least half giant, but here he is half giant and demigod. Along with a far more active and powerful father, Atreus could alter what is possible within the realms of the prophecy. But we should not skip over Baldur's death, which I believe to be very significant to Santa Monica's telling of this tale. In the mythology, Loki does kill Baldur by means of mistletoe, and as a result, is punished for eternity by the Aesir, charging the hatred that would bring on Ragnarok. Here, it is accidental in a way, and Loki isn't the one to deal the killing blow. 
However, I do believe that this will tie Baldur's death in closer to the events of Ragnarok than it is in the mythology, as it not only brings on the fury of Freya, but also the attention of the Aesir, namely Thor and Odin. The differences don't end there however, as the majority of the giants are found dead in Jotunheim. We do know that the giant Anger Boda, partner of Loki and mother of his children, will make an appearance, but without the Jotnar, the Battle of Ragnarok could be on a far smaller scale. Then there is Tyr, who is labelled the god of war in this world. Tyr isn't really a big player in the telly of Ragnarok, but noticing that within this version he still has both hands, he could tie in with the appearance of the wolf giant Fenrir, who bites his hand off when the Aesir try to bind him. That and Tyr was clearly aiding the Jotnar in their evasion from Odin, seemingly putting him against the Allfather. Going by what we have seen, it looks as though Atreus is living up to the prophecies, albeit in a new light, as he and Kratos try to start the events of Ragnarok. We see Atreus seemingly restart Skull and Hattie's pursuit of the moon and sun, but I would suspect that the two believe there is a way to end the rule of the Aesir without destroying all else in the Nine Realms. And if we are loosely following the mythology, Baldur could make his return in some capacity. But pure speculation is for another day, for we have come to the conclusion of our telling of Ragnarok, a story of which I'm sure we will see many differences in God of War Ragnarok, and I personally cannot wait to see how it all comes to fruition. If you have made it to the end of this video, then thank you so much for watching. These videos are a real labour of love for me, and they take a lot of time and effort, but they wouldn't be possible without you guys showing up, so thank you for that. As was the case last time, if there are any other topics or characters or stories you would love to see analysed on this series, then let me know down below. Leaving a like in this video would massively help its outreach, and while you're down there, if you would love to see more content like this and a variety of other PlayStation content, then consider subscribing. Anyway guys, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you next time on Push Square.